doing a shadow puppet of dogs and it's freaking high out. <laughs> Kaya, look. It's okay. It's a nice puppy. I'm sorry, boo boo. It's okay. That was actually just a test to see which one of you sickos would laugh. <laughs> we'll get to that video in just a moment. In just a moment. Do me a favor and, and grab your Bible and, and turn to, to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. We're going to read a little bit there tonight, but... Um, I just kind of want to recap, you know, we, we, the, the children of, of Israel, you know, they're, they're in Egypt and they're, they've been in slavery for years and years and years and God finally gets them out of there and they've gone across the desert 40 years and, and Joshua's been charged to lead this group of people, millions of people, across the Jordan River. Finally, they're going to get to, their, to that long-awaited promise of the promised land. They're going to go there. They can rest. They can prosper. They can worship. They can flourish. It's going to be great. And he's like, Joshua, I want you to lead all these people. I want you to lead all these people across the river. And so we saw last week that that actually happened, that the river is overflowing its boundaries, it's harvest time. And, and, and the, the river, literally, the, the priest walking with the Ark of the Covenant, right? And God is, is manifest powers between the wings of the cherubim right there. And they step into the water and wham, the water opens up and they pass through the river. It's awesome. Absolutely awesome. That's where we're at. So now we get to chapter 5. Now, before we talk about chapter 5, let me just tell you this. I'm really not going to talk a whole lot about chapter 5 tonight because if you read chapter 5, it's pretty much about circumcising all the guys. And I just couldn't think of a prop that would be proper for that. So I'm just going to kind of let you read chapter 5 on your own. We're going to touch on the beginning of chapter 5, but that's really not going to be our effort. That's not where we're going to park. We actually go into chapter 6 now and we see the highlight of the book of Joshua. I think it's probably not arguable that the, the highlight of the book of Joshua is <clears throat> the city of Jericho. The city of Jericho, it's this walled city. <clears throat> it keeps all the enemies out. And, and so the, the, the children of Israel have crossed the river. That's challenge number one. They got through that, right? That was awesome. And now they come to this city. And, and there's a big wall around it, and of course there's army inside it. And so God tells Joshua, this is what I want you, I'm just going to touch on this. You guys probably already heard the story, but I, I just want you to hear this so you don't think that we're skipping anything, just in case you go, hey, I never heard of Jericho. Uh, that, that there's all these people there, and they're crowded around off in the field, and they're looking at the city, and they're like, okay, now we're going to invade the city, right? And the, and the army's going to go in and destroy everybody. Like, that's the normal thinking. But what God says to Joshua is like, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to take your people, right? And for six days, I want you to just like walk around the city. And then stop. For six days. And on the seventh day, I'm not going to do this seven times, but on the seventh day, he says, I want you to walk around the city seven times. And then when you get done, you hear the ram's horn go, Woo! and I want you all to scream. Let's pretend we're the nation of Israel right now. On your mark, get set, go. I don't think that would have done it. I think we've got to give it one more time. On your mark, get set, go. Maybe, maybe a brick would have fallen out. No, but anyway, so, 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 so that's the plan. Who thinks that's a great plan? No hindsight. Don't say, oh, it worked. It's a great plan. If you were there, you think that's a good plan? That's a stupid plan. Everyone would have thought it was a stupid plan, but they did it. And guess what? It worked. It worked. It was an amazing story, but I don't want to talk about that. If you want to learn about that, read Joshua chapter 6. If you want to learn about circumcision, you can read chapter 5. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's funny. Usually what we do when we, when we open up the Bible, we, we read about God's interaction with God's people, and it helps us to adjust our lives appropriately. 
right? Would you agree? That's what we do generally. When we gather and when, we pri- when we're studying in private, that's what we're supposed to do. You see how God interacts with people, you adjust your life accordingly. Okay, but that's not what I want to do tonight either. So it's really, really wacky. Tonight I actually, I want to talk about God's enemies. God's people had enemies, and I really want to kind of focus on them. I want to focus on them. So this is what I want to do. I'm going to read three verses. It's Joshua 5.1, and then it's Joshua 6, 1 and 2. And then this video will start to make sense as we go. And that quote, that was a great quote, by the way. When, this is 5.1. When all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings who lived along the Mediterranean coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan River so the people of Israel could cross, they lost heart and were paralyzed, that's a big word, were paralyzed with fear because of them. Jump over to 6, 1 and 2. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in, but the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. The theme of our study really has been since the start is choose today who you will serve. We could choose to serve anything we want, you know. We, we could choose to serve the Lord, or we could choose to serve the world. We could choose to follow the Spirit, or we could choose to follow our flesh. We could choose to, to, wa- to read the Scriptures and follow what God's Word says, or we could choose to put on television and find out what popular culture is telling us to do. We can choose, can't we? And today I'd like to offer you a different choice. I'd like to offer you this choice today. There's power. Say there's power. There's, no, come on, there's power. There's power in choices. We can make choices. And today I want to offer you this. You can choose to live by fear or you can choose to live by faith. Amen. Amen. Listen, if, if the ultimate question in life is choose today whom you will serve, if that question ultimately leads you, and I hope that it will, I hope it leads you to say I will choose the Lord, then I will offer you this. If you are going to live that out, to actually not just say I will choose to serve the Lord, but live out l- serving the Lord, then you, you, you cannot choose to serve your fears. You cannot. You cannot. The, 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 the scriptures tell us that God has not given us a spirit of fear. That's not how he wants us to live. Jesus tells us that we cannot serve two masters. Can you imagine for a second serving two masters? Can you imagine if you went to work and you had a boss all right, a boss, that he was one level above you, and he could tell you what you could and couldn't do. Imagine if you had another boss of the same power and authority over you, exact equals. And one was telling you what to do and what not to do, and the other one was telling you what to do and not, not, not to do. That, what would that do? That would paralyze you. Do you, ever, you can you imagine? Just think for a second, okay? You're my boss, and you're my boss, and I want to do that, and you're saying, hey, do this, and she's going to say, do that, and I'm like, Listen, I, years and years ago when I lived in Mount Dora, I rented a house. And, and the couple that owned it, it was going great for about a year or so. And then all of a sudden they, got a, they were getting a divorce. Right? So, so, so now I get a phone call from the wife and she's like, no, you need to send me the check. And I'm like, okay. A day later I got a call from the husband. She's crazy. You send me the check. Okay, so wait a minute now. now. So what if I send her the check and I was supposed to send it to you, you're going to evict me. Well, what if I'm supposed to send it to you and, and, or, or her and I don't know, and the other one was, listen, I'm not sending any of you a check. How about that? And I moved out. I, listen, I was paralyzed. I didn't know what to do. I, at the time, I had $525. I think it was $525. That's a lot of money. And I had it on the line. I didn't know what, I was paralyzed because I was in fear. If I give it to this one, maybe this one has the authority, I'm out. If I give it to this one and this one has the authority, I'm out. So I was paralyzed. I didn't know what to do. If you take notes, I think you should jot this down. You know what fear is? Here's what fear is. Fear is, this, anyone like little acronyms? I think this is my first one, five years. 
falsely empowering alternate realities. That's exactly what fear is. That's exactly what fear is. That's exactly what is described in that silly video that you all sickly laughed about. <laughs> that kid, right? What's happening in the, in the video? What's the kid see? The kid sees this scary dog on the wall. And, and look, and the kid's not looking at the, what is the scary dog on the wall? It's, a, it's fingers. It's daddy's fingers. But the kid is looking at the wall and it's just feeding that thing and feeding that thing and it's scared to death because he doesn't have right thinking. He's not thinking straight. He's looking at that thing and he's giving it power over him. He's scared. He or she, I don't even know what that little baby was. But they were scared of that thing because they weren't rightly looking at it. They were giving power to something that didn't deserve it. Let me just tell you something. Here's something you guys think of. Fear, fear feeds failure. It feeds failure. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Who remembers our buddy Job in the Bible? Anyone ever read that book? Yeah, if you're in a good mood, don't because it'll ruin it. Okay, it'll ruin it. Listen, if I was going to make my own Bible, I wouldn't include Job. That was not a good marketing plan. That's how you know it's a real book. Amen. Right? So, so listen. So here's Job. And at the beginning of the book of Job, it said, like, this guy was loaded. He had a, I, I think his, his wife must have been hot. I know it because he had everything else going for him. He had a hot wife and he had tons of property and lots of money and lots of like uh, cattle or whatever. Lots of animals. He was rich. He had everything, right? And the Bible says at the beginning of Job that he was a, he was a blameless man. He was a man of integrity. That's awesome, right? But if you keep reading the book, what happens to him? All that stuff I just mentioned to you. Gone. Gone, every bit of it. Wife says, curse God and die. His kids are dying. He loses all of his money. His animals are dying. He's, he's scraping sores. I mean, he's a mess, right? He's a mess. So God says that he's blameless. God says he's a man of integrity. I get it. I get it. But there's something, there's something in this story that's kind of weird, man. And I don't have all the theology behind it. Like, I can't explain all this to you, but I got to offer you something. Because I read it, and I will not, I refuse to read Scripture and blow it off and go, oh, well, that's just no big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And, 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 and this life, this, his life is destroyed. And in, in chapter 3, verse 29, and you don't have to read in your Bible, in New American Standard, it says this. This guy was blameless, right? He was good. He was a good man. Look what it says. And, and pay attention to the exact words. For what I fear comes upon me, what I dread befalls me. See, there's, there's, there's some power in that, right? It, 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 his, his negative his negative thoughts, he was empowering a false reality because nothing bad had happened to him yet. Everything was glorious, right? He had the most rocking, kicking on all eight cylinders life. And, and so, so what happened? He's like, what I fear comes upon me. See, there's, I, listen, you, you could do what you want with this verse, but let me give you another one. It's, in, it's, it's let me see, Proverbs 27, 3. What a man thinks in his heart, so he shall become. See, so there's some, uh, you can, like I said, you can do whatever you want with this, but I pray you don't, don't just drop it off at the curb. Do something with these verses. There is power in what you're thinking about, what you're giving power to. He was thinking about the stuff that had finally absolutely happened to him. He was thinking about it in advance. Nothing bad had happened, but he was giving power to something that didn't deserve power in his life. And what happened? Wham! It came upon him. It came upon him. Job gave life, he gave life to his bad thoughts, and look what happened. So I'm just telling you, listen, again, I can't give you the theology behind it all. It's a highly contested issue in Christianity about the power of your tongue and the power of your words and all that stuff. But I'm just saying that what he feared, nothing bad had happened to him yet, but what he feared absolutely happened to him later. And what a man thinks in his heart, so he shall become. So it can happen. You've got to be careful what you give power to. Now, I don't know if everyone can relate to that story because I don't think anyone suffered quite to the point that Job has. That's just brutal. But we do suffer. We go through some things. And I want to make sure that before you leave here, you can, you can relate, that God's Word can relate to your life. You can relate to God's Word right where you're at. There's some things 
that we do have in our lives, maybe not as bad as Job, but listen to this. There's a verse in Scripture, it's uh, 1 Corinthians 10.3, it just simply says this, the temptations in your life are not different from what others experience. I don't want to make light of your suffering. I don't want to make light of your troubles because I'm not living your life. And so some of you are paralyzed with fear. Some of you are, are, are scared about even what tomorrow, what tonight will bring. I get it. But just know something. It's not unique. It might be happening with, like, it, that problem never happened between you and me, but the problem has existed before with other people. Like, we all go through the same stuff. And let me tell you something, that's why he's brought us all together. He brought us all together so that we could help one another. Because if I've gone through something and it's common to man, then I can help you when you're going through it, right? And if you've gone through something, you've, you've tasted some victory in Christ, in that, you can help me. And that's why God puts us together into community to, to, to encourage one another. That's why we gather. That's why we gather. But that's not really what I want to talk about. What I really want to say is that there's things that we all go through. We don't all go through the book of Job, do we? Praise the Lord. But we do go through some stuff that is common to all people. And here's the first one. I just say that we live, a lot of us, if not all of us, live with a fear of the unknown. The fear of the unknown. When you look at this story in Joshua... And you see, what, let me ask you, what, what paralyzed these people with fear? What was it that paralyzed them to the point where they couldn't even stand guard and protect their, like they were like whimpering little tearing babies fetal in the corner when the walls come crashing down, the other army comes in and just destroys what made them so, like, wimpy that they couldn't do anything? They were scared to death. What, what happened? Can I just offer you this? It was a rumor. It was a rumor, right? It says that when they had heard what, what, what happened at the Jordan River, they were paralyzed with fear. It was a, like none of them could just put on CNN and see what happened across the world and go, oh my goodness, I could... Honey, did you see what happened? The river opened up. Come check this out. There was no webcams. They weren't there in person. They didn't see it. They didn't witness it. There was no drones flying around taking footage of it. They never even saw what happened. It was absolute rumor. They, they, it said that the Canaanite kings that were on the, the Mediterranean coast, that's on the other side of Israel from the Jordan River. It's nowhere near where this all happened. And based on what they had heard, hearsay, legend, he said, she said, someone reported it to them, and they were so scared, they were paralyzed. No visible, no physical, no tangible interaction with God or his people had taken place with those folks. Yet they feared. Yet they feared. And you know what's amazing? God, knowing his creation, since the fall, since all creation was fractured, he used this intrinsic flaw in humanity to advance his plan. That is brilliant. He is brilliant. He is brilliant. Let me ask you a question. Let me bring it down to you. Because none of us are at the Jordan River. Let me ask you a question. How many people, put up the picture of the cemetery, how many people would sleep there tonight? Now, don't be all tough guy. Honestly, no guns. <laughs> okay, so if there's 100 people in this room. You got one hand, two hands that went up. Okay? I'm not one of them. I'm a big wimp. I would not sleep in that stinking cemetery. No chance, right? Total wimp. I admit it. Keep, I, whatever, you do what you want. I ain't sleeping in there for $10,000. There's no chance. Listen, you know what's really weird? Okay, 99% of you said you wouldn't sleep in that cemetery, right? Why? Fear. Fear of what? 
Okay, Michael Jackson's gonna pop out. What else? Why wouldn't you sleep in that cemetery, you wimps? It's creepy, why? Have you ever slept in that cemetery? Did you ever see a zombie going through there? Have you ever seen a ghost in that cemetery? Have you ever slept in a cemetery and had proof that there's something to be scared about? Or is it legend and hearsay? And ooh, maybe I was told, rumor. That's what it is, isn't it? You have empowered that fear. But let me ask you a question. If you could sleep in that cemetery, but I'd give you a big old fat gun who would sleep in there now. How many would sleep in there now if I said, I'm gonna have Rambo protect you tonight while you sleep? Come on, let me see it. Seriously, you still wouldn't do it? My sermon's worthless. <laughs> the princess has spoken. There's no turlet. <laughs> okay, Edith, there's no turlet. Okay, so, so listen. My, here's my point. As, as, as I offer you tools and realities that will help you get through all that stuff, you're going to start seeing more hands go up. So if I give you a gun, a couple more hands. If I give you a Rambo, a couple more hands. If I give you a, an armed, you know, like the National Guard with a tank, hands will start popping up, right? Because I am giving you something solid that you can count on to overcome those fears, right? And those fears are just false realities that you're empowering with your thoughts. You keep going over and over again. And yet none of us has ever seen a zombie at that cemetery. No one ever seen a ghost in that cemetery. No one's ever seen Michael Jackson come popping up out of the grave with his little white glove going, Thrilla! they've never seen it. But you're scared that it'll happen, right? You're scared that it'll happen. Why? You've never seen it. But yet you're scared to death. You're scared to death. You apply truth to fear and it dies. You shine light into darkness and it flees. We all need something to kill our fears of the unknown to the things that we give power to that don't deserve that power. Amen? God's ideal for you does not include you fearing things that don't deserve to be feared. As a matter of fact, like I said a moment ago, he's given us a not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That means that you think properly about that cemetery. That means you think properly about Jericho. It means you think properly about the mountain that stands before you and you evaluate it for what it really is. It means that you don't look at the shadow on the wall, the elongated shadow of ignorance. It means I don't really know where this is coming from and I'm focused on this big, huge thing when all the while it's just some fingers down here going like this. My friend Hal calls it stinking thinking. And that's what we do. But the, but the Lord of the universe, when you accepted Christ and you bowed your knee to him and he placed the Holy Spirit in you, he gave you in that spirit a sound mind, the ability to think right about these things and not fear things that don't need to be feared. I want to give you something tonight that you can hold on to that is more sure than concrete, like a gun. Right? A gun is solid. You can put your hand around it. It's steel. It's hard. It's heavy. It's real. And I know that I can be safe out there with this thing. I want to give you some of that stuff that's even more sure than that. Here's the silver bullet to conquering fear. Anyone want that? Raise your hand. I do. Okay. Do me a favor and look. I'm going to take you down a little trail. Hebrews chapter 8. I want to hear those pages turning, man. It fires me up. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Tell me when you're there. there. All right. But now, Jesus, when's now? Oh, you guys are on it. Okay, but now, Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, just tell you what that is real quick. The old priest would have to go in constantly and, and give sacri blood sacrifices to the Lord, first to say sorry for their own flaws, and then to say sorry for all of our flaws, and then have to keep doing it because it was never good enough because we kept sinning. 
right? And so they had to keep doing it. But now Jesus has a better ministry. He's like a better pastor than that, amen? He's a better pastor. He's a better leader. He's serving the people in a better way than the high priests used to back in the day. I'll tell you why. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based, here's the silver bullet, based on better promises. Based on better promises. Now, you might say, well, uh, what good is that? What good is a promise from this spirit that I've never seen before? Well, let me ask you this. Who created the heavens and the earth? Who stretched out the stars and knows them by name? Who looked at the, at the mighty oceans and said, this far and no further? Who decides where every single lightning bolt goes? Who decides where every raindrop goes? What field gets rained on and what field does not? Who decides every single person, every strand, any molecule of their DNA and where they live and what they'll do and how they'll speak and what they'll look like? Who did that? God did that, right? And so he's got a real rocking resume. So when that guy says it's a promise, you can count on it. It's not your drunk uncle named Carl who says, I promise I'll pay you back your 50 bucks. And you never see it again. This is Jesus Christ who's making a promise. And when he makes a promise, you can reflect back on creation when he spoke and planets came out of his mouth. That's someone you can count on. That's someone you can count on. Let me take you a little bit further into these, these promises, this, this power, this reality that will break this, the, this fear in us. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1, just a little bit after Hebrews. Hi, Lexi. Okay, so 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. You ready for me to read it? All right. By His divine power. By His divine power. Not us. Not the universe. Not Mother Earth. Not nothing. Him. God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. I gotta just pause there for a second. I wasn't gonna go here, but let me just tell you something. When you gotta, like, uh, I run into people that have really bad habits, and, they're, and, and you ask them about it, and they say, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord to help me with that. That is called lazy. According to the scriptures, he has given you, when you bent your knee to Christ and he put the, the same spirit in you that raised Christ from the dead, don't you think that same spirit can help you quit smoking? Okay, I'm just, I'm done with that. All right. Okay. He's given us everything we need for living a godly life. If you smoke, you're welcome here and we love you. Just a side note. We have received all of this by coming to know Him. To know Him is to know life eternal. To know God is to know the Son. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And when you come to know Him, you receive all that power in you already. When you come to know Him, the One who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence and because of his glory and excellence, in other words, because he is so amazing, because he is so powerful, because he loves you so much, nothing that you earned or deserve, but he is so awesome to you that he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. It is our desire, whether you want to believe it or not, is to, to give power to our fear. That's our default. That's what we do. We're like that little baby. <laughs> we have no idea that it's just little fingers. We have no idea that God's right around the corner going, come here, son, I'm going to fix this problem right now. And we're looking at the problem going, ah, I can't make it anymore. I'm at the end of my rope. I can't do it anymore. And God's like, come on, son. Come on, son. I'm right here. I'm going to hook you up. I'm going to hook you up. He's given us these promises so we can share in his divine nature. You want to be like 
Jesus, you have, to, you have to not just want it or hope for it. You have to tap into the power of his promises. You tap into the power of his promises. And he delivers. God's promises kill fear. They kill fear. But the promise, you've got to look at the text, though, just so you know. The promise is for the believer. This promise is only available to those who came to know God through his son Jesus. Now these promises are all over the scriptures, but I just want to share just a couple of them with you tonight. This one here about, about fear, this promise that conquers fear, is found all over the Bible. It's found in Deuteronomy. It's found in Hebrews. It's found in Isaiah. It's found in 1 Chronicles. It's found in Psalm 23. It's all over the place, and it's found here in the book of Joshua as well. When Joshua is charged to go with two million people, to, to go across an overflowing river, to face an amazing uh, army that's going to conquer them, They're, he's unsure all this, looking back for 40 years of failure, and then he's going to try to walk in the footsteps of the great one Moses, he's probably full of fear, wouldn't you agree? And so what does God say? He says, here's this insurmountable task on your own. There's no way this is going to work, but you just go ahead and don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm with you. Because I'm with you. That's the, that's the silver bullet. When you realize, you wrap your brain around, you, around this truth that, that the God of heaven and earth is by your side. When he has put his love upon you and his spirit in you, he's there with you all along. And so mountains become molehills in the presence of Almighty God. He says this to Jeremiah as well. Found in Jeremiah chapter 1, 5 through 8. Here's a summary of it. He says, Jeremiah, this is kind of weird. I knew you before I made you. It's kind of weird, right? I knew you before I made you, and I decided then that you were going to be my mouthpiece. You would speak on my behalf to the nations. Now just imagine for a second. Just imagine any one of you. You're, you're, you're 17, 18 years old. You're trying to figure out what you want to do with your life. And all of a sudden, a voice from heaven says, I've already decided what you're going to do. You are going to be the mouthpiece of Almighty God to the nations. You will bring down kings. You will raise up nations. That's what you're going to do. Now, don't you think that scared Jeremiah a little bit? Gave him a little fear? Wouldn't it give up? I would be fearful. If, if God came to me and said, listen, there's 7 billion people in this world, but you're the guy. Woo, buddy. I'd be scared. I'd be scared. So what does he tell him? The same thing. He's scared. He's fearful. I get it. But don't be afraid. He follows it up, the next verse. But don't be afraid. Why? Because I will be with you and I will protect you no matter where you go, no matter who you face, no matter how strong the, the army is. I will be there with you. I will, you will never go by yourself. Unless you think that is isolated to specific men in Scripture, the high and holy ones, no, no, no. See, the same God said something at the end of Matthew 28, and he said something again in the beginning of Acts 1.8. He said this, he said, Now all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Now go and make disciples of what? Of all nations. You're going to be my mouthpiece, all of you, to speak to the nations about me. You will tell them all that I've taught you. You will baptize them. And guess what? I will be with you always. And he said in Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses, not just here in town, not just in Mount Dora, not just in Apopka, not just in Zellwood and Ocala, but to the ends of the earth. And no matter where you go, guess what? I am right there with you. And I want you to start thinking that way, church. I don't want you to think that, that this task is too big, that this church is too small. Listen, it doesn't matter how big or, this, or small this church is. This is 12 guys that were just fired up about Jesus, and they shook the planet. They still do today. That's the reason why you're here. And so amazing things can happen when men and women are sold out onto the gospel. They recognize the power inside of them, and they're willing to say, yes, Lord, send me. Send me. I will be with you always. And so the silver bullet to conquering fear of the unknown 
is simply this. No matter where you are, no matter who or what surrounds you, no matter how dark it is, the steady constant in all of it is that the one who stretched out heaven and knows the stars by name, the one who literally looked at the ocean and said, this far and no further, the Red Sea opening, Jordan River opening, creator and sustainer of heaven and earth said no matter where you go, no matter what nation you face, no, what, no matter what kind of pain is before you, I will be with you. I will be with you. Amen. Now that, to me, I don't know about y'all, that's something real. That's real. All of a sudden, that, that handgun that felt so real, it seems like a little pea shooter, doesn't it? We're calling on the creator of heaven and earth, the star-breathing God. Here's another thing. It's not just fear. Here's another, here's another fear that's kind of common to men, another temptation that's, and that's our thing, is, is God never tempts us, but we're tempted to, to fall into fear and to give it power when it shouldn't. We see that fear actually displayed not in chapter 6, but in Joshua chapter 7, let me just tell you what's going on there. God said, I'm going to give you this city. And when the walls fall, I want you to go in and I want you to just kill everybody. But all the valuable stuff, the gold and silver and all the fine linens and all that stuff, I don't want you to burn that or throw it in the trash heap. That's mine. That goes to the treasury. Don't get that. I've given you the promised land. That's your promise. That's your, that's your, that's your provision. It's all going to be there for you. Don't worry about that stuff. Well, there's a guy named Achan. And, and, and he saw the gold and silver. And, and, and he's just like us. God, you, I know you promised to take care of me, but I don't think you can really. So he saw this gold and silver and he stole some of it. And, 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 and when no one was looking, he, he gathered up some of this gold and silver and this fine robe, and he, and he took it, and he stuck it underneath his tent so nobody could see it. You know what? I, I don't know. Maybe this is just conjecture, but I'm kind of sensing from this that he just didn't feel like God was enough. That all, all these years of provision through the desert, manna from heaven, quail, water from a rock, right? That that, that wasn't good enough yet. That, that the water opened before his eyes. That the walls fell down when the people yelled at God's command. And it still wasn't good enough for him. And he needed more. And so he saw the gold and the silver and the robes. He's like, I got to have this so I can be taken care of. And I don't know if you'd like to admit it, although this is a great place to do so. Aren't we all a little bit like that? I know I am. So really we're talking about this lack of provision, this fear that you won't be taken care of. But we don't have a spirit of fear. That's not what he wants for us. I want to share a verse with you, I think, uh, that'll help. And then we'll kind of unpack this one, this fear of the, the provision, the lack thereof. It's 1 John 4.18, and it's, it just simply says this. Perfect love expels in other words, gets rid of all fear. It expels all fear. So what does that mean for you? Let me ask you guys a question, all of you here. Some of you had really crappy dads, and I understand it. I'm one of them. I'm not a crappy dad. I had a crappy dad, although my kids may think otherwise. I had a crappy dad. Okay, so I understand this may be a tough question for you. But just in a moment of complete sincerity and honesty, answer this question. If it's a good dad... If it's a good dad, do they provide for their loved ones? Do they? They do, right? They do. So do me a favor. We all agree on that. Do me a favor and go to Matthew chapter 6. We're, we're worried that we're not going to be taken care of. And some of our lives, are, we're so filled with fear. We're paralyzed. We don't know what to do. We, 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 we feel like we have to work 24-7. And, and our balance in our life is completely out of whack. I, I, I was victim. I worked so much for a family I never knew. They're gone. I, I felt like I needed to work more to provide because I didn't really trust in the provider. And, our, and, our, and, our, and our, our lives get out of balance because we put too much pressure on something. And it, that something is our self to work harder and make more money 
neglect our family. Where are you? Where's daddy? Where's your husband? He's, it's the weekend. It's seven weeks in a row. Where is he? He's working. Why? Because we have 27 car payments, a 50,000 square foot house, and we need those. Financial Peace University starts on September 2nd. <laughs> Matthew 6, verse 31. This is the Lord Jesus talking. Let's give him the attention he deserves. He says, don't worry about these things. He's going to tell us about what these things are. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Let's just summarize that. What is he just saying? Those are our needs, right? Our basic needs, you know, like food, water, shelter, clothing, that, our basic needs. And, and Jesus is going, why, why, why are you worrying about these things? Why, why are you worrying about these things? Look, this is, this is, a, this is massively convicting. Listen, look at the next line. Thinking about that stuff, it says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. He's tightening the screws down on you. This, look, we're supposed to be different, right? We're not supposed to live in the spirit of fear. We're supposed to be different. And we're not supposed to be thinking about and worried about and, and, and deciding of the priorities of our life and, and getting our life out of balance, deciding how we will act and how we will think and how we prioritize things because of this stuff, fearing that we're not going to be taken care of. Because look, why do we need to not think that? See, we have a different father than some, right? We have a different father. Not, not everyone's a child of God, you know. We're, we're all creations of God, but to be a child of God is to say yes to the Son, to say yes to Jesus, and we have the privilege of be calling sons and daughters of God. And so when we're a believer, it says your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So, so, so listen, li, li, who can I pick on? <laughs> <laughs> Manny, Manny, my love. Who would you rather have provide for Wilma? You or Jesus? <laughs> yeah, come on, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Who would you rather have provide for you? Stephen or God? Yeah, how many planets have you breathed out of your mouth, Stephen? How many people have you raised from the dead, Patrick? So come on, how many flowers have you created, Lean? How many things that God has done have you done? The best you could possibly muster up is to go work 40, 50 hours a week. And at the end of the day, that ain't going to cut it. It's not going to cut it. It says that these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Now here is the promise. Here's a promise from the star breather. You ready? Seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those things that he already knows you need will be given to you. You don't need to work like a crazy freak to try to get him. He already knows. If you want, listen, here's the thing. If you want to work like a crazy freak to get him, he will let you. And you are stupid. There's no reason for it. Why would you go after like a crazy man when the creator of heaven and earth goes, I already know what you need, just let me give it to you. Just seek first my kingdom. In other words, don't just tuck God in on Saturday night, Sunday morning, obligatory prayers before meals. Maybe I bend my knee before bedtime, praying with the kids. Don't tuck them into the little nooks and crannies of your life. Seek first the kingdom of God. So what he's saying is, listen, if you want God, the creator of heaven and earth, to take care of your needs so you don't have to, just go after him with your whole heart. Seek first his kingdom. Like, do whatever you can with everything you've got. Commit all your resources, your time, your money, your focus, your creativity. Go after a relationship with him. He told Jeremiah, I think it was, if you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. That's what you're supposed to do with your life. You don't tuck him into the nooks and crannies and fit him in when, you're, when you've got time. You make him the center of your life. And if you have any time left over to do anything, which you probably won't because I know him, you can go do other stuff. But you make seeking his kingdom the priority of your life. Go after him and grab this relationship that he wants you. But seeking the kingdom first must 
must include that same passion, that same zeal, that same earnestness to go after other people with the good news of the gospel so that his kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. That is a huge amen for me because that's what I live and breathe for. So someone please, please, please say amen. (sighs) Seek first the kingdom. I already said all that. Okay, good. So here, so he says, I'm here, and I'll provide. I, I've heard people say this, and I, and I, I don't like to, sh- I don't want to, uh, what's the word, to shrink God down in any way, but I don't, I don't like to, 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 to use this quote, but I've heard it said that, like, if you take care of his business, he'll take care of yours. It's a lame attempt to try to explain what I just screamed at you for the last 30 minutes. But, but that's kind of what it is. He's like, if you'll, if, you'll, if you'll come after me, you know, make me the priority of your life and, and make the sharing of the good news of my son the priority of your life with other people. Like, if you'll do that, you're my agents of reconciliation. I'm going to make my plea through you. If you'll do that, I'll take care of your mortgage. I'll, I'll make sure you have clothes on your back. I'll make sure you eat. Do you know that Elijah had ravens bring him food? Did I get that guy right? Yeah. I'm hungry. Okay. So he brings a bird with some food. It's crazy to me. So, so let's, ki- let's kill some fear so we can live as God desires, right? We want to live like he said to Joshua and, and several others. Be strong and be courageous, right? Powerful, confident. That's, we're, that's the way we're supposed to live, right? But you know what's funny is that none of those, none of those words, strong, courageous, confident, those are good words we should live there, but none of them are actually the opposite of fear. As a matter of fact, I don't even think that fearless is the opposite of fear, to be honest with you. The reason why I say that is because fear has this, and you guys can, I'm sure you can all agree, fear has this way when it gets inside and starts dominating you, it, it adds like inner confusion. Like, it, 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 it confuses you. It, doesn't, it makes you like, I don't know what to do. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I, I, this inner chaos, and it paralyzes you. And, 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 and I don't think that's the way God wants us to live. I think that the opposite of fear really is peace. Like, this is just me. Like, it's not Bible. This is just me. I think it's peace. I, think it's, I just think that's the opposite of fear. So instead of being Job... And giving fear life, God has something else for you. And here comes another rocking promise of the creator of heaven and earth. And then we'll be done. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Turn there. Whoo. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Here's what it says. It says, are you guys all there? Okay. Don't worry about anything. Can, can, we, can we put, can we, listen, I'm not God. I'm not changing the Bible. Can we all just agree that, it, that he's saying quit worrying, like stop fearing stuff. Don't, don't fear anything. Quit worrying about stuff. Don't look at the situation in front of you and worry about it and be scared of it. Don't let it rule you. He said, don't worry about anything. This is the God that says, I'm always with you and I'll always provide for you, right? Remember those two promises. Let's capitalize and build on them. He says, this God says, don't worry about anything, but instead pray about everything. In other words, I'm the God who's always with you. I'm the God who promises if you seek me first, I'll provide this stuff for you. So he's like, listen, lay your need out before me. Listen, listen here. Don't look at them. He wants you to lay your fear out before. Listen, he's like, son, daughter, tell me, what is it that's that's bugging you? What is it that you're afraid of? Lay this thing before me because I'm the God who's here. I'm the God who who wants to help you. I'm the God who wants to provide you out. So so, so lay it before me. And then he says, listen, 
He says, come, come to me and, and tell me. Tell me what you need. You can read it. He says, tell me what you need. Thank me for what I've done in the past. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind as you live in Christ. So, so what he's saying here is, is if you have something that you fear, rather than being a little baby and looking at this dog and giving it power and being afraid of it, Come to the one who's always promised to be there by your side, the one who's always promised to deliver for you, to, to provide for you. Tell him what you need, right? Just come to him and say, Father, th this is what's on my heart. This is what's bugging me. This is what I'm afraid of. And then he says, but then thank me for what I've done. In other words, start conjuring up the memories of all those times you came to me in the past and you needed something because you were afraid and I came through for you. How many people in this room have had him come through so many times? We could sit here all night and talk about this stuff. And he's like, if you'll just conjure up those memories, all the times I delivered for you in the past, you can watch fear die. And this unexplainable peace will come upon you and it will guard your heart and guard your mind. There's that sound mind. No more stinking thinking. You can start thinking straight, thinking rightly about this thing that's in front of you. And you can take your eyes off the elongated shadow of the fingers that portray a scary dog or a dragon on the wall and get your focus on that and realize what it really is. Nothing when compared to the strengths and the promises of Almighty God. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask the gentlemen who are going to give out offering to come forward. And when I get done praying, they're going to give you the communion elements. I want you to hold on to them. We're going to take it together as a family. But right now, I'd like to pray. So I'd like to, I'd like to take a moment and pray with you. And we're going to do some work with God. Okay? We're going to do some work with God. And we're not going to rush through this. We're, we're, going, we're, going, to, we're going to put him in the center of our focus right now. If, if he's not the center of your focus, I need you to, t to take a minute and, and close your eyes. I need you to think about Jesus. Don't look at anyone. Don't look at me. Don't look at anyone on the stage. Don't look at anyone handing out communion. Don't think about what they're playing. Nothing. This is the time for you and Jesus to do some work. We all fear. We fear the elongated shadow of nothingness. Lord, we suffer from, from, from bad thoughts and we give power to those things. We suffer from stinking thinking. We don't, we don't, we're not experiencing the sound mind that you gave us when we said yes to you because that's not where our focus is. What I'd like for you to do now, loved ones, is to do this. I want, and this is a scary thing, but I want you to do it. Because he's ready to help you. I want you to think of the one thing that you fear the most. I'm not talking about the boogeyman in the closet or the sharks under the bed or anything like that. I'm talking about real, honest to goodness fears in your life. You're afraid to step out in faith because you feel like you might fail. He's called you to greater levels of generosity, but you feel like you won't be able to pay your bills. He's called you to greater levels of compassion, but you fail to act. He's called you to greater levels of love and forgiveness, but you're afraid to extend it because your transparency leaves you vulnerable and you're afraid of being hurt. He's called you to the ministry and you're afraid because you heard it doesn't pay. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to take this thing, whatever it is, and lay it at the foot of the cross. My prayer for, for my loved ones here, my family who I love so much. Would you help us, if there's one thing I could ask for tonight, is that you would help us somehow. I, I don't even know how this all works. 
that somehow you'd let us tap in and experience and feel, literally feel your loving arms around us and tap into the spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And that lives in us. Help us to apply your promises to always be with us no matter where we go, no matter what nation we, you send us to, no matter what controversy awaits us, no matter how dark it is, no matter how many, how many people persecute us, how many people oppose us, no matter how big the army is, no matter the threat. Help us to realize that you're always with us. Help us to get our minds straight on provision. Help us to realize, Lord, that you love us and a loving daddy always provides for his children and that we do not need to fear. Whatever this great fear is that has dominated our thoughts, has controlled our emotions, have dictated our actions, help us to lay it at the cross and cover it with your precious promises. So take a few moments and do that, and then we'll take communion together as a family.